Okay, so welcome to uh, the first part of Lab 9, uh, where we're looking at the donkey's data set again, and we're going to have a look at whether sex matters for the body weight of the donkey. Uh, so this first code block is going to be reading in the data, loading up our libraries, and doing a plot of sex. And we can see from the plot that there's not much difference, right? So if you look at the, um, the centres are around about the same, the boxes are in around about the same place, the ranges are around about the same place, everything is about the same. So from the plot, um, we can't see any major differences between male and female donkeys with respect to their body weights. The centres are about the same. Spreads and shapes are similar. Right, so what we'd expect when we fit a linear model for body weight using only sex is that things wouldn't be important, right? And that's what we see here. So this is what we did in, um, in lecture 8 as well. And so we can, you remember that when we, when we uh, fit a linear model with a categorical variable, which is like sex, then what, what we do is we replace the sex variable with a numeric variable, which is 0, 1, an indicator variable. So it's 0 if you're in the baseline group, which in this case is females, and it's, well, it's 1 if you're in the, um, in the second group, in which case you are male. So in that case, the intercept represents the average of the females, Right, which is when the indicator variable is zero, which means you're in the in the baseline group, the female group. And the male effect is then the difference between this, the females and the males. So, my, uh, so uh, we can tell from this that the females are going to be, um, so females are included in the intercept term as the baseline group, i.e. females weigh on average 121.4 kilos. Uh, males, um, the sex male effect is then the difference from the baseline group intercept females to the male group. So males are on average 1.2 seven seven kilos heavier than females but this is not significant right so the p-value is very high so what the p-value is telling us here is that the um, the value that we got from our data 1.8 kilos um, is what we'd expect to happen by chance just due to sampling right if there was no difference in the population so if the true value of the of the of the uh, male effect, so the difference between females and males was zero, then we'd expect to get differences as large as 1.8 kilos in data quite frequently. Right, so our conclusion, um, so our conclusion is there is little, um, there is, uh, so our conclusion is that our data uh, consistent with there being no difference between male and female donkeys. Uh, no difference in body weight, in average body weight between male and female donkeys. Um, the R squared, what about the R squared? Term is really small. Uh, this model is only explaining 0.1% of the variation in body weight. Okay, i.e. basically everything is unexplained. Right, and that kind of makes sense, right? Um, the only thing that you could explain with this model would be the differences between male and female. We've concluded there really isn't much difference. So we haven't explained anything. So the R squared would be expected to be really small. Okay. Now that doesn't actually mean that sex is unimportant. What it means is that we can't see the importance of sex in this model, uh, mostly because of the great variation in body weights within sex. 
right? What we're trying to do is we're trying to spot the, um, so the R squared is measuring um, essentially the, the proportion of variation explained by the grouping variable. And the only variation we can possibly explain in the, by the grouping variable is the difference in the center. But the difference in the center is really tiny compared to the amount of variation within each group, which we can't explain with this model. Right? But we can explain the variation within each group with the other variables we have. Right, We see all of these ones down the bottom here that have low body weights, well, they're all the small donkeys. Right? So if we use the size variables like heart girth and length and height and so on, we'll be able to explain the fact that these are small. They don't weigh much because they're small, and similarly these ones up here weigh a lot because they're big. And once we've explained that, we're going to essentially reduce the amount of variation within each sex that is unexplained, and maybe then a sex will allow us to distinguish some of that unexplained variation. Okay? So that's what we're going to do down here. So, no, this does not mean that sex is not important. It just means that by itself, it is not good at explaining body weight. Okay, so next we're going to fit a much more useful model where we're going to include heart girth, umbilical girth, and length. You remember that height was not important after adjusting for those three from the from lecture um, eight. So we're going to run this model, and what we see is heart girth, umbilical girth, and length are all important. The p-values are small, and so is sex. Okay, so interesting. From this, we see that. Uh, the measurement variables heart girth, umbilical girth and length are all important um, for after controlling for the other variables and explaining differences in body weight so is sex, i.e. after explaining some of the difference in body weight using the measurement variables, we can now see there is a difference uh, in sex with the male donkeys being 2.8 six kilos heavier on average than the females all else being equal i.e. two donkeys the same size the same heart girth umbilical girth and length but one being female and the other male the male will be heavier. I.e. sex may be capturing some of the variation in body weight that isn't explained purely by size. Okay, so perhaps it might be something to do with shape um, or something like that. Okay, and we can see the R squared is high as well. So at um, 0.85, so we're explaining 85% of the variation in body weight with this model. Okay, and so now we're going to visualize the model. Um, so we're using VisReg on our L on our model LM2. LM2 is the, what we call the model, right? And we should basically get the same thing from the visreg as we did from the summary table, right? So let's have a look. So we get a plot of heart girth, right? We've done uh, we've uh, done four separate plots for each of the variables in our model. So we can see that um, we've got an increasing relationship between body weight and heart girth, as you might expect, an increasing relationship between body weight and umbilical girth, and an increasing relationship between body weight and length. And we see that males are heavier than females. 
So that all agrees with what we see here, right? We get an increasing relationship with heart girth, increasing relationship with umbilical girth. These numbers are all positive, and males heavier than females. Okay. So this is what we'd expect. Increasing relationships uh, between uh, the measurement variables and body weight and males heavier than females. Note, um, we also can see some potential issues, right? If you look at the extreme ends here of the heart girth graph, you see that most of the um, residuals, most of the donkeys are actually higher than what we're predicting. And the same, I think, with most of the other measures, right? Most of them are higher at the end. Um, and you can also potentially detect that you've got some slight um, lack of symmetry here, right, where we have um, some quite heavy ones um, above. Okay, so this is a little bit hard to interpret really because the order here that they put the observations in is somewhat arbitrary, right, and so you, you, you can't worry about like trend here, okay, because it's just, it's just a random ordering. You can worry about trends on these graphs, right, so you can um, be a little bit concerned about that. So that suggests that we're probably fitting, the, fitting things in the middle okay, but the linearity assumption possibly doesn't hold for these variables. Okay. Right. Okay, so let's check the linearity assumption. Uh, well, we could check them all. Look at all the model diagnostics. So this first command here, this par miff row thing, um, that's just setting up a two by two grid. So let me get rid of it so you can see what happens if we don't have it. Right, you just have each of them in turn, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay, so the par miff row just allows you to kind of see them all at once. Um, so the MF row bit is um, setting up a two by two grid. That's what the two and two is. The mar bit is just reducing the size of the margins a little bit. So this is the number of lines you have below the plot, to the left, uh, above, and to the right of the plot in terms of the number of lines, if you like. So you remember the, the main thing we look for on these is the very first one, the residuals versus fitted plot, and we can see evidence of a trend, a curve, right? So linearity here doesn't seem to be met as there is a trend curve on the residuals versus fit, fitted plot. Uh, there's also fanning of the residuals about that trend, suggesting equal variance is also not met. So at this point, we're pretty much done. We can stop because our model was not any good, right? If linearity doesn't hold, then there's a problem with your model, and we might as well stop. Um, normality looks okay anyway. Um, we ignore this one. Remember the scale versus variance plot, and then we can look for for um, potential outliers. There's not really much point looking for potential outliers if linearity doesn't hold. Um, sometimes you can see some when linearity doesn't hold, even though um, you know once you fix linearity, it might not be a problem anymore. So once you spot that there's a problem with linearity, uh, at that point you try and fix it. Okay. Um, we're not asked to in this case, but we'll, we'll try and do it anyway, just for sort of extra for experts, if you like. Um, note that there's no problem with this plot at the moment, the residuals versus leverage plot. You remember you only get a problem if you get points past the Cook's distance bands, which are up in the top right and bottom right. Notice we can't even see them here. They're off the page, okay? So all our data is well within the Cook's distance bands. We, we don't have a problem, okay? You don't have to worry about this red line here, in fact, my advice to you is to turn it off by saying add.smooth equals false. If I can spell it correctly, here we go. Just so that it doesn't freak you out, right? It's not on here either, but you could still see the, uh, the curve trend and you can still see the fanning of the residuals around that trend, right? Small variation here, increasing variation as you go across. Okay. No problem with normality and or with uh, the or with the leverage. No points of high influence. Um, we 
might try and fix this. Extra for experts. Um, with a log transform. So just the same as uh, we did with the when we just had heart youth in here, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to take our model that we fit before up here and we're going to transform it with a log transformation. And there's a couple of things you could try. You could try the um, uh, you could try just transforming the outcome variable so that would be worth a, worth a shot. See what that does. Okay, um, this increases the R squared. Everything's still important. Um, so we've got a we've got a better model, um, and then we could try just plotting it. Let's just look at the. Um, let's just look at the first one. Okay, that's actually looking pretty good. Um, notice there's potentially a slight down curve, but maybe not that much of a problem here. I would be happy with that, actually. Um, the other thing you could try is you could also try logging the other numeric measures. Okay, so you could log the heart girth, the umbilical girth, and the length. Notice that it doesn't make any sense to, um, to log the sex, right? Because sex is actually a grouping variable. So you could try that one instead. Okay, that looks even better. Right, so the trend through here is completely flat and the residual variation is about the same. Okay, so that seems to fix things right up. Um, and in fact, we've got an even better fit, right? We're almost at 87% the R squared. So you'd, you'd expect your prediction intervals to be quite sm to be relatively small now because there's only 13% of the variation unexplained. The actual equation is a lot more complicated, right, um, to use because you'd have to measure these three things, you'd have to log them, then put them all into the equation, and then unlog in order to get the body weight. But you know, you can imagine, you know, having a calculator on your phone or whatever, that or a little app on your phone that did that for you, right? So, um, you know, the math side of it isn't actually a problem. Um, you could implement this in the field, no problem at all, and you get better. Um, you'd get better predictions. Okay, so this model is way better. So um, R squared is higher at uh, almost 87% um, and the residuals versus fitted plot shows that linearity and equal variance hold. Yay! Downside is the equation is a little bit more complicated but that's what computers are for. Okay, uh, let's check that that can knit. That looks okay. Awesome. Uh, we need a need a carriage return here. I need a need a need an empty line. There we go. That'll look better.